Aye. Good morning. Hi, guys. Hope you know me by now. My name is Omolata Mebude, or better known as School Meeting Guy. I'm here again in this setting because I wanted to tell you about this kid. There was this little seventh grade boy. He was a generous 5'3", a little chubby, and an absolute hardo in every sense of the word. We never dream of turning in an assignment late, always put his best foot forward, and that's it. He would sit in front of the classroom, and if his hand wasn't raised to answer a question, it was either filled with a pencil taking notes or spreading, speeding through worksheets or even writing his afternoon schedule in his little day planner. <sighs> this kid was obviously striving for something. He was striving for what he thought was greatness. It had been a long seventh grade year, and this tool of a kid had a perfect report card. I'm talking about serious perfect, like, ab like A's across the board. Guys, I know it might be surprising, but in fact, this kid was me. I had one more English paper to hand in on the very last day of school. I did this paper pretty well, uh, one of my best papers to date. I showed up to class completely ready to enjoy my final class of my final day of seventh grade. When I strutted into that English class at exactly 2.35, my worst realization had come to pass. I had forgotten to print out the paper. Now this may not seem like a big deal, but my English teacher had made it explicitly clear that these papers were meant to be printed before class and handed in at 2.35 or else no credit. Little seventh grade me immediately started begging. I was on my knees, crying to my teacher, pleading he would let me quickly walk to the library and print it. He finally let up and said, Omo, I'm really not happy with you. I expected better, but you can go print it out and I'll just have to dock 25 points. My worst nightmare had just come true. I had just been told that my previously unblemished report card was in jeopardy. This C would ruin my, un, would ruin, this C would ruin my year and leave me with a B on my report card. I vividly remember what had happened next because it would influence the rest of my life. I thought about running downstairs to the library, attempting to operate the rocks my school called computers, grabbing my printed out paper and then sprinting back to the classroom just to get a C. I must have actually snapped because I just stopped crying, got off my knees, looked at my teacher, and just said, nah, I'm good. Then I proceeded to go sit down and watch a movie, pretending that I didn't just have a breakdown. He gave me a chance to earn points I didn't deserve, and I decided to say, screw this, I'm lazy. That summer, when my report card came, there were 23 A's and one C. And if you have ever known, had me as a student or know me personally, then this story isn't that shocking. I constantly turn in work late or don't do work. In my Brooks School career, I've had a bad track record with handing in late work. Just ask my advisor, Mrs. Waters. I'm constantly asked by my teachers and friends why. Why I don't meet these deadlines. Why I feel the need to push back my work and wait till the last minute. Why I think the work isn't worthy of my time. There is a simple reason. Seventh grade Omo made the realization that these 15 minutes that he would have spent getting that paper would soil a day that was supposed to be great. If I had gone down to that library, I would have been thinking of that stupid mistake. I would have beat myself up for being a certified dumbass. It was a task so simple that I completely fumbled. I do not believe that I would have been able to ever let go of that B on my report card which looking back on it might have not actually been a B if getting a zero on the paper dropped my grade to a 75, but it's not the point. So in that moment, me choosing to finally let go saved me. Before that paper, I had a one-track mind. I was gonna get all A's in middle school and then go to Columbia High School, join the Model UN team, and then student gov, become the president of both clubs while maintaining a 4.0 GPA. From Columbia High School, I would go to Georgetown, get a degree in microbiology while on a pre-med track, then graduate, ace the MCAT, then go to medical school. After med school, become a doctor. Then do so well, change the game, fix everyone, and then become Surgeon General, just like that. 
then live out the rest of my life in a nice house with my wife and kids. That was my dream. That was what seventh grade Omo thought a dream was. That's why I look at you today and say, when that seventh grade boy decided to not run down to the library, he saved me. He reached out into the future and gave me the option to have a life that I was proud of. So I asked myself every day of my eighth grade, freshman and sophomore year, what is a life that I'm proud of? I would lie in bed every day from six o'clock and contemplate. And I couldn't come up with an answer. I'd wake up every morning and realize that I didn't know what my dream was. I had just underwent 13 years of believing that I was living for myself when in reality, I was listening to my parents. I went to school because my parents told me to. I made friends with the smartest kids in class because my parents told me they were good influences. I spent every Saturday from 11 to one in piano class because my parents said it's a good skill to have. I went to the library every day after school because my parents told me it was a better environment. I spent every Thursday night in prayer and Sunday in church because my parents told me that God was real end of discussion. I quit Taekwondo and Boy Scouts and lost almost all my friends to be sent here because it would set me up for a better life. Not to say that it was a bad decision, but to say it was a decision I never got to make. I had this idea that I would magically become Surgeon General simply because my parents wanted me to. For reference, I found out what the Surgeon General actually was while I was writing this speech. I was feeding into hopes and dreams that weren't even mine. Every step I had taken, every breath that I had inhaled had been for them. It took me 13 years to realize this whole time I hadn't been living. So for two years, I'd wake up each morning and think about the fact that my life had no meaning. For two years, I would go to bed hoping that I wouldn't wake up the next morning, hoping that by some miracle, I wouldn't have to ask myself why I was living, hoping to dear God that I would either find an answer to life's question or die before I was struck by the bus that was reality. Well, at 15, I came to the conclusion that there was no answer. I literally could not find a purpose for getting out of bed each morning. Doing homework, handing in tests, studying, eating, feeling, just being alive. I didn't see the point to it all because no matter what, I'm going to die. No matter what my life will end, I'll be in a six feet underground in a coffin. Well, that was really my first crash. Sophomore year was the first time in my life that I said, fuck it, I'm living for me. So I stopped doing homework assignments. I stopped the studying. I didn't do anything that wouldn't bring me joy. What I thought was making up for lost time was just a spiral into this dark, dark abyss. I was throwing my life away because I wanted to finally be in control. I wanted to be in charge of my own life. So here I was completely giving up and ready to move on to the next phase of my life when 8.50 hit on one faithful Thursday in February. It was my advisor meeting with Sean Yell. Going into this meeting, my highest grade was a 96, 97 in concert Corral. The next highest grade was an 80. I was expecting to get the reaction I had gotten all year. I was expecting her to yell, to tell me, to get my work done, to just be furious. Said she sat me down, looked me in the eyes, and said, are you okay? And I paused, and I said, yeah, yeah. I just don't want to do work right now. That is what I had been saying to everyone, to get them on my back, and it had been working. Then she continued to stare at me with nothing but love in her eyes. And then came the waterworks. I fell into an uncontrollable sob, telling her, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. I'd finally taken the wheel and I was just sabotaging myself. I told her, I don't feel like there's a reason to keep going. She responded to me by getting a box of tissues and just giving me a shoulder to cry on. In that meeting, I found out that there isn't really anything. There is no roadmap, no destiny, or no point. But everyone keeps striving to attain happiness that's why I constantly say that seventh, boy, that seventh grade boy saved me. Because five years ago, I was living the lie my parents told me was my life. But right now, in this moment, I'm living for and will continue to live for my happiness and moments of joy. Now, I'm certainly not telling you to not turn in your paper or not to study. 
I'm telling you to study because you want to study. I'm telling you to write the paper because that's what you want to do. Just make your life yours. Because what is a life worth living if it's not your life? Thank you. Thank you.